area. It was also the dispatch area. There was only one person that worked here. He was the dispatcher, he was the turnkey, he was the one that checked everybody in, handled stuff through the window right there. If somebody wanted to buy a candy bar, there was a file cabinet there, they could knock, he'd get up, sell them a candy bar. And, uh, but this is where everybody was brought in. So over in this part, this was all dispatch area over in here. And this teletype right here, which we call the green machine, was sent here for us to use. But the problem was is only about two people know how to use it. And I was one of them and I hadn't even got out of high school. <laughs> so every, when people had burglary complaint and they lost stuff in order to send it out, they had to wait for me to get out of school, come home and send it out. <laughs> so I ran that for a long time. <laughs> this picture right here, outside. this picture right here is my father. And that's with the, the machine gun they used to rob the liquor store here in Ellsworth with. But this is my father over here. Oh, yeah. So. Who's that other fellow? I have a name Walter McIntyre, but he was state police, which they they all worked together really good back then. Right. I mean, they still do, yeah. but, but in fact, that picture right there on the wall is my father. These are past sheriffs up here on, on this wall here. Okay. Do you know of any list of sheriffs? Like, I mean, because I, I, I know that courthouse lost a lot of its documents in the in the 30s, you know, in 1930 from the fire. But do you know of any list of sheriffs or? There was, God, uh, Norm Dyer was prior to 1955. Then my father. And then we ended up having Howland Urquhart, had Bob Williams, his sheriff, and. Actually, it might have been when Billy Clark was here 30 some years. So, but Billy worked for my father. He was a detective for my father at the time when he did. But one of the big cases that happened out of Hancock County was when Miles Connor, a guy that committed a burglary in Sullivan, and when the deputy got him down there. When the deputy was trying to call for backup, he ran over and shot the radio out of the cruise, out of the, his own car. We didn't have cruises back then. You used your own car. You got reimbursed for mileage. But while he was sitting in the while he was sitting in his own car trying to call on the radio, Miles kind of shot that out. They brought him in here and they were holding him here. And one night when we were watching TV in the living room, which is down the hall, we heard the the turnkey scream, and what had happened is Miles Connor had escaped, and what he had done is he had taken a bar of ivory soap and carved it, carved it into a gun, and taken shoe polish and colored it black, and when the turnkey opened up the door, he stuck the gun in his chest and told him he was going to kill him, and pushed him back, and he ran out the door and ran down over the hill. He was gone for he was gone for five or six days, but when he went down over the hill, they ended up calling another deputy who had that always claimed that he had a dog, a, that a bloodhound that could track people. So due to that fact, they ended up calling this deputy in with his bloodhound, and he came down. And he went out through, and they went down over the bank, and then they got to the river, and he stood at the river barking down there. And he says, well, he went down, and he's crossed the river, so we're going to go on the other side. So they walked him across the bridge, lined up pretty much on the other side, and the dog went up over the hill, and they went up to what's called Mountain Rock off Grant Street. And they got up there, and they lost the track. And my father then says, I'm not sure if this dog really knows anything. <laughs> 
important dog. Because you can find it. So anyway, once Miles Connor was caught in Hancock, Miles Connor confessed. He ran down to the river, got into the river for about ten feet, and then thought, "I'm not going to make it." So he came back out, and he went up, and he hid into the in the cupola at the library right next door. He stayed there for two days. Never even did cross the river. <laughs> they chased him up over the hill. <laughs> But he ended up getting out, and they caught him down in Hancock. But the gun he had was right here. I had this gun, and I gave it back to the Historical Society. Oh, that is so cool. How are you? I'm good. Are you telling some good stories? So cool. Again? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't get titles. Listen to them. You've heard them. <laughs> Did you get a picture of the gun? There's always that one. Oh, I've got many pictures of a gun. Yeah. Yep. So Jerry. that is the gun right there, and that's a book that he wrote because he's a famous art thief. And if you go online about him, Miles Connor, you're going to find a lot about him, about the museum robberies in Boston where he stole all the paintings out of there. But he also is a very good friend of my son, Eric, that works at the sheriff's office. Eric talks to him frequently. He talks to Eric frequently. So they just become friends. And when my mother turned 90 years old, Miles even came up here and went out to eat with all of us out to governors. So he, he kept in close contact. And he's out now. And like I say, he still talks to, talks to Eric all the time. But if we... Is, that isn't locked, is it? All right. We're going to go in here just a little way. We're not going to go on the other side because that's why they're having the problems. But this was when, when he was going in to check the inmates at night, once he unlocked the lock on here, he had to get in there, reach out, put the padlock back on so nobody run out while he was in there. So, anyway, these were the. Contact. These are the cells, and they look the same on the other side. Just hope you have the key. <laughs> hope they don't get the key away from you. These, these are the, what we call the drunk tanks at the time. There were two of them. These two right here. And I was telling them up there, these, these wire mesh that's over the windows were never there. It was just the bars and the windows. And if they brought in a, a drunk and he was belligerent and all they do is haul and scream. They used to call the firehouse. The firehouse would come over the fire truck, stick the hose right in there, run it in, and just keep putting water on them until they stopped. But you couldn't do that now. They probably wouldn't mind that. Well, it's amazing you can have special cells for alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not really amazing, but. That was, that was a shower room down there at the end. This, this was not here, because the jail burned after, after I was, I mean, I was in law enforcement, but the jail burned, so they ended up shutting that off. But the end cell that you can't see because of the stuff on the wire is up here was the woman cell. And there was a woman in here, she was an Indian, and I'll just tell you her name was Susie. Susie was in here the day that I was born. She was doing a 90-day stretch in here for snaring rabbits off the reservation. But she never was in anything else after that unless it was intoxication. She'd come in and she'd do either a 30, 60, 90 day sentence. She'd get out, she'd get out and buy a bottle of alcohol, get drunk, fall down the street, they'd bring her back, then she'd get sentenced again. She lived here the whole time I was here. I never made a bed the whole time I was growing up because she was the trustee. She came out, she helped with the cooking, she did all the cleaning and did all the making of the beds, the laundry. She was a big help to my mother. But she was always in here. And then when I got into law enforcement in 1973, because she, like I say, she was in here in 55. When I went into law enforcement in 73, I ended up, I had to arrest her too. So she not only brought me out, but I ended up arresting her and bringing her back to jail a few times. So, <laughs> but that's all the jail doors were back then, is this. They used to use Yale locks on them. And the one directly behind us on the other end down there, there was a guy, a rugged guy in there, and he wanted to talk to the sheriff after my father. And he says, I don't want to talk to him. He says, go lock him in his cell. So they went down, they locked him in his cell, and he says, the sheriff doesn't want to talk to you. The guy reached out, grabbed the bars, put 
from the inside and went like that and snapped the Yale Walker off and he said, now go tell the sheriff I want to talk to him. So we went out and he did come in and talk to him. <laughs> but he snapped that Yale Walker just like it was paper. You're going to have to do better than that. That's amazing. But the steps get upstairs used to be right here. But after a period, they shut that off up there. There's 11 cells, and one of them held four. But back then, the only time you ever used it, actually, you never, we never locked anybody up at night, unless it was the drunk tanks, or unless it was an unruly prisoner like the one I told you about. But they used to, they used to sit at, there was double tables sitting down here, and they used to <coughs> eat down there, and play cards down there. And uh, they'd go to bed when they wanted to. The light stayed on all the time. So we'll move into a different part here. But I see Hope Talk outside. That's where I went to work for. I, I, was, I was living here at the jail and working at Hope Talk House at the time. And I don't know why that's here. Not the Hope Talk. Is that the jail? Yeah. 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 On your post to it up. I saw you yeah. then. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah. You see that? <laughs> so that Dan's birthday on it when she held that up. Oh, really? I tell him, don't change the date. No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that's birthday. right. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this was this is where all the inmates' food, where all our food, we ate the same food as the inmates did. My mother did the cooking for 20 years while she was here. She didn't get paid the first 15, then she put in to get paid, and they paid her $50 a week or $35 a week or something. But uh, there was a lot bigger stove in here at the time. There was a big one, and there was a table that fit right in here. But like I said, this is where all the cooking was done. And once the cooking was done, it went in. This is this is where something on Facebook is different. This right here is the wicket, not the one upstairs. This is the wicket. And this one, this one would slide open. That's how they served the inmates. That's how they sent the dirty dishes back out here, is through there. Refrigerator and freezer was in here. So everything was done right here. In fact, there's a lot of things done here. I mean, why we why they had preparing food and everything. We had guinea pigs we were raising out here in the <laughs> We had big boxes and there were guinea pigs in there while we were, you know, which really wouldn't go over big now. Not really. <laughs> no. I wouldn't. But I've got I've got videos that have been they've been put on the they went from VHS to DVDs and stuff. Oh, the inmates used to give us haircuts. If one of them was in the new how to get haircuts, they used to give haircuts to all us kids so we didn't have to pay for a bar book. They taught me how to ride a bicycle. They taught me how to play cards, cribbage, polka, pool. Who is Anything. the one that built all the toy boxes? Bros Graves. Because I still have my dad's. Yep. Yeah, he built three of them. They were the, the head of our beds upstairs. But uh, this this shelf right here, this is where this is what we always look forward to every every Monday. Because my father used to put quarters on here, three quarters. That was our allowance for the week. 
one for Terry, one for Alan, and one for myself. We always look forward to that, but 25 cents back then was a lot of money. Yeah, uh, now you can find that out in the yard right now. <laughs> but, no, a lot of things, I mean, they used to be company come in. If my parents went on vacation, if they took us somewhere, the inmates just come out and did the cooking. We didn't have another cook to do it. The inmates did it. They did everything. My parents took us away for a weekend. The inmates took care of everything. If they took, if just the two of them went away, one of the inmates would watch us. And then at night, we're back <laughs> in. That's amazing. They did. They brought us up. And I mean, that showed when my mother passed away, when my father passed away, there was inmates that we had had back then that either contacted them or came to the funeral. I mean, because they were always treated really well. And they never forgot it. But it was a lot of it back then. The inmates, the majority of them, were in here for intoxication. That, and in the winter, they they get locked up intentionally because they had no place to go. It was warm during the day out there. My father would go out and unlock that jail door at seven o'clock in the morning after breakfast, leave it unlocked. The inmates would come out. They'd either go out and shovel snow, or in the summer they'd go out and they'd mow the lawn. They'd go downstairs and do the laundry. They'd do anything to stay out. At lunchtime, they all come back in, went back in, ate lunch, all come back out. And they didn't shut the door until night. But all the inmates, if you open them up and let them go now, five hours later, they'd be in California. Back then, they didn't. They, they had no reason to go anywhere. This was their house. And, uh, it was a little bit like a pork farm. A little bit like a subsidized place for people who were down and out. It was, because yeah. they had no place to go. But obviously you also dealt with more dangerous criminals that must have been shipped off to other they were. more serious they were. prisons. That, yep, they yeah. were. They were shipped off to different jails or they were sent to be held in Thomaston. Right. But basically all they held here was just, you know, Intoxication people, disorderly conduct people. They used to, there was a board out there, and all they would do, they'd write their name on a piece on a piece of cardboard, and they'd stick it on the board so everybody knew who was in there. And that's all it was uh, for amazing. booking. I mean, they had a booking sheet, but but that's how they kept track of who was in here. And the inmates used to tell. Tell them out there, says, Well, I get out tomorrow. And they said, Well, we'll check. And he said, No, I get out tomorrow. And he said, All right, good enough. So the next day, they let him go. <laughs> they kept their own track of when they were supposed to get out. But they were always back very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Long enough to go buy some alcohol. But that Susie, the Indian I, Indian I told you about, she was from the Micmac tribe out of Canada. And she was always in trouble. And one day, my father and mother, when she got out of jail, decided they were going to take her back to Callis, let her cross the border, go back to the Micmac tribe. They took her all the way to Callis. They dropped her off, said goodbye to her. They came back. They stopped at a um, well, restaurant, Machias. Helen. Helen's. They stopped at Helen's to eat. They got back to Ellsworth. When they got back to Ellsworth, they came down Main Street. And on the Union Trust steps, there was Susie drawn mm -hmm. laying on the steps. She beat him back here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to stay yeah. So she, she got a ride from the tractor trailer back and he dropped her off there. But she had a couple bottles of vanilla with them. That's what she had bought and that's what she had drank. So that's all she ever drank. It was vanilla. Vanilla. Yeah. Yep. It was. But uh, in this room here, this was the formal room, dining room. The only time we ever ate in this room right here was holidays. Thanksgiving, Christmas, anything to buy a big meal. There was a lot bigger table here at the time. But this was the dining room. And uh, we had, there was one inmate in here, I, I don't even remember what it was, but it was somebody that hadn't been an inmate very long. They got, tired of me is we locked me in that closet and left me in there. I was in there, I don't know, a while anyway, but when he came back, he was shipped off to another institution because they didn't want him here if he was going to treat, treat kids like that. Because all us kids were all brought up by the inmates. 
How old were you then? Did you launch in the... Oh, I probably was like seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what this, this was the formal room, and it was the telephone room. The telephone set in that corner right there. One of the old answering ones there. That we had a guy in here by the name of Ken Clark. We had friends up from Massachusetts, and my, they were friends of my mother and father's during the summer, and they had met, my mother and father had friends which were related to Kim, was Ken and Blanche Clark. Well, little, nobody ever gave it any thought. The Ken Clark that we had in jail was a different Ken Clark, but at one time he was married to a woman named Blanche. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he, uh, the people who come up from Massachusetts okay, met the <laughs> Ken and Blanche Clark that were related to Kim. Well, then they got back and they called one day, and the Ken Clark that was the inmate answered the phone, and they, they said, "Who's this?" He said, "Ken." They said, "Ken who?" He said, "Ken Clark." He said, "Well, how come you're answering the phone?" He said, "I'm in jail." You're <laughs> <laughs> in jail. He said, oh, "Yeah, been locked up for intoxication." Well, they couldn't believe it. Well, they didn't. Know. They said, "Just one was married to Blanche." He goes, "Yeah." <laughs> it just totally went downhill. From then oh, on. That is too funny. And then they disowned this other fellow. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh god. But that was another funny story. In this, uh, I didn't show you one exactly, but you know, because it's a good story. It goes with it. This door. But what they ended up doing is they ended up putting in this one-way mirror. It's a fingerprint on the other side. So if something was going on out there, my father could come out and watch see what was going on. And if he had to go out, he went out. But it it was really great because every time they brought somebody in, we'd all run up and open the door. <laughs> and walk. Well, the same people I'm talking about from Massachusetts came up one weekend, and my mother said to them, they says, you're here on a weekend, and we've got the one-way mirror put in now. Maybe something good will happen tonight. And uh, so it was on a Friday night, and the blue lights come in the yard, and my mother says, oh, we've got a hot one coming. That's Ellsworth PD coming in. <laughs> and so... Everybody ran down the window. My mother opened the window, and everybody was peering in the window. And the door opened up. Alpha PD brought in the guy, handcuffed, threw him. He landed on the floor, and the guy was kicking and screaming. My mother looked. She goes, "Oh Jesus, my brother!" <laughs> <laughs> so she pushed that button and she went out there, and she told him, "She said, you get into that chair right now, and you shut up and don't want to hear any more." And he goes, "Okay." So he did. He got up and sat in the booking chair there. But that was the first one they saw. Through the window with my <laughs> uncle. So, <laughs> oh my god. But my mother was rather embarrassed about that. Know, so I <laughs> We've got company. Get yourself. <laughs> this right here was the, the living room. This is where we had Christmases, and this was the TV room. It was so much smaller than the mm. one back then. I guess I was smaller too. So, but the trio was sitting in that corner where they would put that one. But my father used to sit in that corner right there. That's where he was the night that Miles Connor escaped. And he heard it when it happened. And he went out. He said, over here. Well, there was a big easy chair. Uh, there was a couch there. But this is where the, the TV was. And we were the remote control. Dad would say, Ernie, go change the channel. But back then, there was no remote control. Well, that was Ernie. Other than us. That was it. I used to hide money here. Because this right here used to move. Don't do it. Oh, yeah. Maybe there's some money back. You want to check last time I did the Uh, this is where they were the night they saw the blue lights coming in. You could always see them coming in. Let's go see what's doing that door with my brother. Yeah, my mother was rather embarrassed about all that. Well, let's go upstairs. These stairs right here used to be our timeout chair. 
one brother was here, one was there, and the other one was on the top. That's where we had time out. I bet you had it a lot. But <laughs> I'd like to have gold for every time we slid down this bad Yes. This right here was the only bathroom there was in the whole living quarters. So my sister was the only girl beside my mother. So there used to be a line of guys out here waiting for her to get out of the bathroom <laughs> so we could use the bathroom. But like I say, it was the only one and it was always occupied because there was so many kids here. This room over here is where Kim's father, Alan, and I, and Terry, other brother, all had our beds in here. We had triple beds. And these boxes that Kim was talking about that were made by the inmates were at the end. But we used to see a lot by looking out this window. There was one night that they brought a guy in downstairs. And you people, you know, some of you know my mother. But my mother was pretty well endowed. But <laughs> Not much to look at, but well done. <laughs> but one night they brought a guy in and they hauled to my father and said, We gotta have help. So he goes downstairs and I can hear him down there and I heard him t I heard chairs going and there was all kinds of noise and dad told him, he says, You're going if I have to break you in half, you're going in there in two pieces. Well, mm -hmm. my mother got out, she came in, we're all looking out the window. She comes in and she says, let me look. So she opens up the window and she's trying to look down into the booking room right below here. And she's got a nightdress on and she's leaning out there to the wind and trying to see. And she's hanging out there just as fast as far as she can. And there's a guy night crawling on the lawn at the courthouse wearing a headlight, headlamp. And why she's looking and all the noise is going on downstairs, my mother finally caught on. The guy night call was watching my mother. He had the light on her and watching her. Because <laughs> everything she had was hanging oh, out. No. So he didn't care about the fight. Yeah, he just no, wanted just... Or the night crawlers. <laughs> right. But we used to hear everything because the booking room was right below us. So, <laughs> these were never here. They've, these all been added and everything. But this is where... Our rooms were already at three of us. This one, this one over here was my mother and father's room. And one reason that they had this room is because in the middle of everything. This, room, this is what they call the peak hole. And the peak hole, you can look right into the jail and look down with with a supper table, uh, lunch table and everything was right below him. If something was going on, my father could look and he could see what was going on down there. If they were too loud, he'd open up and tell them to shut up. And when he told them that, they shut up because they knew that they could be locked back in the cells and not, not let out. But that's why they picked this room here. So, I mean, they certainly didn't want the kids doing that. Was the window open when you do you remember that window? Could you see through the window to the bathroom? Like, that was never open. It was never open. Okay. No. Yep. Never was. No. This room here was a spare room. People, when they used to come from Massachusetts and stuff, they stayed in this room here. It had a big double bed in it that sat this way. Nobody ever used it because everybody had their own, you know, other than the three of us in that room there. All this other stuff is all added that's new here. I don't know where they. It's all smoke. Yeah. So it wasn't something your mom saved then? No. No, they didn't save any of this. Yeah, I'm leaking. I'd mm. say that the historical society has come up with all this. Right. So, what was your favorite room in the house? Uh, 
throwing out. I think I think probably the living room because that's where everything took place. Yeah. I mean, at bed we had not real bed, but I, everybody hung out in the living room. And like I say, it looks so much smaller down there now. But I was smaller, and so was anybody else at the dawn. Hmm. So, but this room over here was my sister. Did somebody slept upstairs or not? Or? Yeah, they did. Okay. But I see there's a sign across the front. Oh, yeah, of we can go up. We can go up. I just didn't know what to do with it. You oh. can move it out of the way. He had yeah. two more brothers. It's hot up there. Up there. Oh, but it's always yeah, funny to go to the third here. floor. Never? If, he, if Danny stayed here, he stayed in there, but he didn't live here. Why don't you step up there? Yeah. Just crap all over yeah. Yeah, that was a bad part about these steps anyway. Yeah, there's no railing. Not forward. I've never been up there. You haven't? No. You want to go first? No, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just close the door behind you. Oh, the higher we go. That's about what we talked about last night. Oh, you should wait because you're sure. They could just do that, and the bell would ring, and he'd come down to it. I'm surprised that's still there, but I saw that when I walked in. But the paint job was a little better then. Was this, you know. was this the oldest brother who wound up getting his own room for a while? Was that, that yeah, Greg had this room. Yeah. Look at all this cloth. Mm. This is a cool room. Sure. That room. <laughs> This room right here, on the right, right here, was access. Over in this corner over here, there's access that goes out over the jail. And in each cell down there, there was a there was a opening at the top with like a a, a flue that went up in it. For what reason, I don't know. But my father used to come up once in a while, and he'd go down and he'd take liquor bottles out of there. Whether they had stuffed up in there, how they'd gotten in there, nobody knows. But they, they used to get the. Oh, yeah. That's. you want to see it, then you want to see it. You can see the door on the Come take books out. I don't know what I have to, what they ended up stealing the books. I've seen pictures of Just let it go. But that's what that room was for over there. There was, a, there was another door off that one, Chris, right there. That, uh, actually, just with storage area out there. 
that wasn't anything. And she's like, I wish you wouldn't call it that. I'm like, well, Joey, call it. I understand. She's bad people. Up there. You can feel the difference coming down the short budget. I was going to say, we just keep Halloween, Halloween costumes and everything in here. They've got all kinds of uniforms in there right now. We had kids here all the time. A lot of kids in Ellsworth. And if I put out of kids that grew up in Ellsworth that were always here to come have a tour, you wouldn't be able to fit them in here. Because I, I get kids ask me all the time. Kids. I get adults my age ask me all the time. Do you ever, get, do you ever go into the old jail? And, because if there was no inmates in the old jail, we used to go in and play jail. <laughs> we did. That's where we played in there if there was no inmates in here. And there was times that there was no inmates in here for, you know, a period of time, you know. I mean, we sobered up for a little while. Yeah, but the, all the neighborhood kids used to come down and uh, play. That would be a great haunted house. Are you like, kidding? Like to decorate for Halloween. Yeah. That would oh, be awesome. awesome. Oh, yeah. Yep. Do you have any memories of the basement? Yeah, downstairs in the basement. That was closed off last time I was here. Mm -hmm. We didn't go down there. But downstairs in the cellar, that's where the pool table was for the inmates. Inmates just come out, go down, play pool. And I'm sure on the wall down there, their names are still on the wall down there. Because <laughs> everybody wrote on the walls down yeah. there. And there's the name etched in the glass in the window in the, in the cell block, too. Mm. I think it says the car thief or something like that. McCarthy? Like, that, no, car thief. Like, oh, car like thief. Like in for oh, field right. cars yeah. or something. Yeah, well, could have been. But, no, oh, they used to, like I say, in the morning they'd come out, they'd either go mow the lawn, do the laundry, come out and help my mother cook, go down and play pool, but lunchtime they were all back in there again. Because that's the only food they had. So, but it was a different breed of inmates back then. Mm -hmm. You would not, we deal with a whole bunch of different ones now. Yeah. I can only imagine. But in 1973, when I graduated from high school at 18 years old, I graduated on a Friday. The following Monday, I was full-time at the sheriff's office at 18 years old. Back then, you did not have to go to the academy within the first year. I didn't go to the academy until I went to Ellsworth PD in 1976. <laughs> And when I went in, eight, in 1976, it was eight weeks. Yeah, wow. yeah, wasn't very long then. But they certainly have extended it, what, to 18 now? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Wow. But I don't know more I can tell you about it, but it was, was amazing. It was, it stuff, was great. Sure. Yeah. It was it was great life growing up here. Really enjoyed it, and so didn't the neighborhood kids. <laughs> We always had fun. I mean, they'd all show up here. We'd go to the city hall, play football over there, or play wiffle ball on this lawn. I used to sell night crawlers growing up, and I used to get night crawlers off these two lawns, the library lawn, the courthouse lawn, and the city hall lawn. And I sold a lot of night crawlers growing up. Everybody, all mom, dad, friends were saving the soup cans and everything so I could put night crawlers in them, because I did sell a lot. And back then, I, didn't, I can't remember how much they were, but I was happy with them. But I'd go out and pick, pick up 500 night crawls after a storm. Hmm. But people always came in. We had a guy walk down by one night. We were standing in the doorway. My father was standing in the doorway. 
some drunk walked down the street and the night crawl sign was out on the lawn. Guy reached over and got it, picked it up, and threw it over the road. My father walked down the stairs, went out and arrested him, brought him back up here. I mean, it was just. <laughs> Nutty guy. <laughs> yep. What did the inmates have for clothing back then? Did they they could wear their own. They wear their own. Yep. Yep, they did. What was the menu like? They ate good. We ate good. <laughs> My mother was a great cook. Susie wasn't much of a cook, the Indian, the one I was talking about. Because one mom and dad went away for one night and they ended up buying Susie a piece of steak to cook. Well when they came back and they said they asked how the steak was, and she said, Oh, it's real good. And they said, Well, how'd you cook it? Did you fry it or did you broil it or what? She said, No, me boiled it. <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> that's how she ate it, you boiled it. Mm. When you guys but, went grocery shopping, was that? My father did all that. So did they reimburse him yep. through the county? They did. He okay. just turned the slip over to them. He had a limit? No. No, no because it, when he did the shopping, he did all the shopping for us and the jail. Okay. Just bought more of it. <laughs> but we were brought up on all the jail food. Where did he go shopping mostly? Well... Tom Guthrie had a store on High Street. I can't remember what the name of it was now, but that closed up. But he, I remember going out there with him when he bought it out there. But we, we never had a truck to deliver food. He always just bought it right at the store. What was Saturday night's dinner? Beans and hot dogs. So did you have a set set menu? They did. Yeah. And she tried to keep it. I mean, when she had enough junk to throw in a hash, she made hash. <laughs> left over everything. <laughs> but, like I say, we had it too. So it and so it was, it was good. It kept us alive. Nothing changed. Is it three meals a day? Yeah. 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 Now, your mother also worked in Michael Povich's office for a while. Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was a secretary right there. Yep, yeah, she enjoyed that until she finally retired. But. I'll tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have given up my first, well, like I say, I was, 20 years I'd lived here, but I was, before I was an officer, I, uh, at 18, I was here all the time, but then I was out living other places after that, but it was the best 18 years of my life growing up here. I learned a lot by growing up here. One thing you never talk back to your father if he was a sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school one day and I wore two different colored socks. And they laughed about it downstairs when I left. I got to school and the principal, they called me in the principal's office and said, you're trying to start a new fad and we're not going to have it. Oh my said, God. we're putting you out of school for three days. Okay. So I came down and walked into the office. Father was in the office. He said, what are you doing home? I said I got put out because they said I started no fad up school for two different colored socks. Sorry, right, I'll be back. So he left. He came back about a half an hour later. He says, you go back to school tomorrow morning. I said, why? What happened? He said, I went in there and told him that you were going back to school tomorrow morning. He <laughs> said, well, he's trying to start a new fad. And he said, no, he isn't. He got another pair of socks at home, same exact color of the ones he's got on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I so paranoid about starting. Oh, they were. They were really paranoid about it. That is just amazing. Yeah. By the time we got to high school, I'm only five years younger than you, right? By the time we got to high school, it was like a free study. We, we were running the, running the place on our own. We walked to school. We never, no, no bus or anything. We had to walk from here. Because we used to go to the, I used to start at the Norton School, went to the Moore School. And then at high school, I ended up having my license anyway after a certain time. But we used to walk to school every day. And there was a lot more than us. I mean, when by the time kids were from across the bridge, I don't know. How did we you walked, get? We walked to school. Yeah. Well, the bus came to Court Cross Street, I think, for the little, little ones. But no. you could only ride the bus if you were little. Right. You got to be junior high, we walked. Just yep. to school. Well, this side of the intersection, we had to walk. Right. We weren't allowed to ride a bus. Yeah. yeah. I think that was a rule on Bridge Hill. You had to be a, 
like certain age. Yeah. <clears throat> but I know my brothers, they they loved it here too. I mean, Kim's father, who has passed on, Alan, I know Alan loved it here. We just had so many good times here while my father was sheriff. Did, did your brothers go into law enforcement as well? Uh, my oldest brother, Greg, that had the room on the top, the only thing, he was the closest one to going into law enforcement, and he started up. Surrey Police Department, which is no longer, but he was he dispatched for a while, but that was the closest. I'm only, I'm actually the only one that went into law enforcement out of the family, mm -hmm. and I've got two sons. One of them works at the jail, and one works at 911, and the one at 911 been there 20 years, uh -huh. so they both went to that. Yeah. But. Oh. They enjoy it. That's what they always wanted to do growing up. Because I was a police officer then, either with Ellsworth or with back at the sheriff's office, where where I finally ended up at the sheriff's office. So, but that's pretty much the history of this. That you know, I'm sure going back through rooms and rooms, I think of other stories, but. I've told you stories that will always stick with me anyway. Yeah. So, I hope it was entertaining and it was very worth it. it. Yeah. You know, down in the morgue, they've got the booking records still back from like the 1920s. Is that right? So, Ooh. they still have some old records. I that was there. the morgue. Huh. I'd like to find him because I was I was asking because when I worked at Ells with PD, I I was working one night and I arrested a woman one night, a girl, by the name of Sheila Shepard. And I arrested her for OUI. She was driving a Volkswagen Beetle. I took her to jail and gave her a kit. It, it was down here where I took her. And she all we did, we gave the breath test back then. She could get bailed after that. You didn't need anybody to pick her up. She paid whatever the bail, bail price was, and she left. She walked. She went up to High Street, Sunoco, without us knowing about it, and took her car. Well, it just so happened I arrested her at 1 o'clock in the morning. And by the time she got out of here and got up there and took her car from High Street, Sunoco, it was probably 10 minutes to 2. At 2 o'clock, we had to turn the clocks back. And at one o'clock again, I arrested her again for a while. <laughs> yeah, they're, and they're, look, they're looking to kind yep. of find something to do with them because they're permanent records. I think they're out of them. Yeah. But they're all down in the old morgue. So, I mean, they're, they're the ones that are almost. They like, should be in big books. Yeah, but there's some that are like written on the index cards. Oh, yeah. And yeah, but there, there should be some big ledger books yep. that they wrote them in every day. Yep. They're all in the morgue. Oh. I might be able to find that because I was telling the guys up there about it because one time on Bobby Bones he was talking about the bonehead play of the day where a guy got arrested and then he got bailed out. Seven hours later they arrested him again for OUI and I told him, I said, right, so I arrested one at one o'clock in the morning, arrested her again at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <That's about right. laughs> but she had taken her car and we didn't know it and I stopped her again. But I never forgot her name and never forgot what she was driving. Because it was so out of the ordinary to arrest her twice at the same time, same day. Yeah, so much for daylight savings, so. Yeah. I think Chad Wilmont was the quickest he ever did for, for me, and it was, I think, 13 minutes on a book and bail and then re arrest. Yeah. Or now. <laughs> so. I don't know. It, if there's any other questions that anybody's got, I'll do the best I can to. Answered. I remember that there, being like that growing up, it's, it's, split like that. So nobody's ever done anything with that. It's Why been was there, that way for a long time. I don't think it's really changed. No. Why was there a toilet at the top of the steps in the basement? You know, there's that strange what? toilet Aww. at the top of the steps. Yes, yeah, like steps that go up to it. Or oh, down cellar. Yeah, down cellar. Oh yeah, it was like going up in a throne. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, that was a bathroom. It was, all it was was just a toilet. The inmates used to use that. When they were out doing laundry and stuff, yeah. that was theirs. Yeah. But you, it had steps to get up to it. It felt like you were on, a, you know, a, 
podium up there yeah. in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, it's a little creepy. <laughs> I won't even go here. In the, in the back room. side down there, if you walk out where the furnace room was and look towards the back of the jail, yeah. there there's, should be a pipe that goes along yeah. there and stuff. Well, there used to be, that used to be the shooting range. And people would go down there, deputies would go down there and shoot. Yeah, well, I went down there to try to dig lead out of the big pieces of wood that they had down there, and it fell over on me. And the only thing that saved me is those those 